to because not only is the choir singing but the congregation is so good to see everybody worship. Good morning! Welcome to worship this morning as we begin to calibrate our hearts heavenward. It's one of the things that we do. We gather here and we try and just get rid of the world and remind ourselves what we're called to. So here the, the salutation that the Apostle Paul gives to the church at Galatia. This is Galatians 1, 3 to 5. He says this, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory God bless you. Welcome to worship. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here in the room this morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. And we would say welcome to those of you who are watching on television this morning. We're grateful that you're able to worship with us in that way. And you may not be aware on television, we were having audio issues in the room. So we're trying to get all that worked out. But um, we're, we're grateful that we can be together. We're grateful that we can worship together on this Sunday, number 47. This is day 325 of this pandemic. And so on day 325 of this pandemic, I'm, I'm grateful to be with you and glad we can worship still in this way. But as we do, and as we come together on this day, I want you to look ahead with me for a moment to day 328. Because on day 328, which is this Wednesday, we are going to do something important and something special. In fact, this Wednesday is our day of fasting and prayer, and we're going to fast and pray together. Now, this is a time for us to cohesively seek after the Lord together during this pandemic. You know, we know that it is God alone who's going to bring us through and heal our land. And so we're going to seek His face, and we're going to cry out to Him together. In fact, Wednesday uh, evening, we're going to get down on our knees together and ask God to come and intervene. And we'll pray that with His mighty hand, God will come from heaven and set us free from this virus. And so on Wednesday, we are going to fast from sunup to basically sundown. The timing of that on Wednesday is sunup is 7.22 a.m. Sundown is 6.13 p.m. And we'll be in the middle of our prayer service that, that evening at 6.13. But in that time from about 7 a.m. to really about 7 p.m., we're going to be fasting together. And we want you to feel free to fast however you wish or need to. Um, you may want to fast from technology that day or something like that. Um, but if you're able, um, I'd like you to fast from food with me. Uh, the point and the purpose in that is to seek the sustenance of God, that on the times that we would normally eat, instead we would go to the Lord in prayer, and we would seek His face for the healing of our country and for the protection of our church and go to God with each and every one of our needs. Now, the way that's going to work for me on Wednesday as I fast is what I typically do is I will have water. In fact, you have as much water as you would like or need to stay hydrated. And then in moments of severe hunger, uh, I will have a piece of bread. Now, both of these are intentional, and they draw us back to the person of Jesus Christ because as we know when we're at mealtime and we have a glass of water, that we're coming to the Christ, who is a wellspring of living water. And kind of the same time, when, when the moments of real hunger where I have a piece of bread, it's coming back to the Lord, right? Where we know that Jesus Christ is the bread of life which comes down from heaven for us. 
And so we're going to do that together. So I ask you to fast with me on Wednesday. And then Wednesday evening, we're going to have a prayer service right here in this room at 6 p.m. And so will you come and will you pray with us that God would intervene and show his might in all of the ways that he can show his might. And so when we get together and we pray in that evening, it's going to be just prayer and scripture. There'll be plenty of room in the sanctuary to socially distance. And we're going to be on our knees before God, crying out to heaven for healing. And what we expect is God to intervene in such a way that we look up to heaven and say, this must be our Lord. And that's what we're praying for, because we know that it is God alone who is our Savior, mighty and victorious. It's God alone that we worship. And so we come together, and we come together on this Sunday morning to sing praises to his name, and we're going to sing praises, and we're going to know and expect the victory in Christ that is coming. And so let's sing with all of our heart, and let's seek the Lord with all that we are this morning. So let's pray, and we'll continue in worship. Lord, we're grateful that we can be together. Lord, we're grateful that we can worship in all kinds of venues and all over the city. Lord, we're grateful that you've given us the technology to, to make those kinds of things happen. And Lord, we pray that as we worship that we would look up and recognize your goodness. That we would say Jesus is Lord. Lord, that we would sing it fervently. Proclaim your goodness in your coming kingdom. And Lord, we pray that you'd be blessed in that. And Lord, we pray that as we continue to worship that your spirit would descend upon this place and ignite something holy. And Lord, that we would experience the Christ in new and exciting ways this morning. So Lord, would you come and bless this time of worship. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So as our pattern of worship, we begin with scripture and song and prayer to help us remind ourselves that this hour is not about us. To get our hearts and minds focused heavenward. And then once we are reminded of that, we move into a section where we use scripture and song and prayer to focus in on the word of God, what he has called us to this week. Um, I don't know about you, but whenever I get to a service where I'm worshiping, I'll get the bulletin and I'll thumb through it and I'll go, oh, I like that song. Do you do that? Great. Or maybe, maybe I'll look at one of the scriptures and go, oh, I know that one. Did you do that today? Did you look at this Matthew and go, I know those words. So here's what I want you to do. I want you just sitting right where you are, I want you to say this prayer with me. This model prayer that Jesus gave us in his own words to say this, shape your prayers like this. Now you may be like me, I learned this in a different translation. You say it in whatever translation that you know. I'm gonna read the, the NASB that, that we typically use here at First Baptist, but let's use the words of Jesus to help frame our worship this morning. This is Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we've been reading this week with Jesus and his, his interaction with the Pharisees again. He is thinking about heavenly things all the time. And he reminds us that we need to get our focus off of the, the, the minutia and get our eyes on Jesus because God will take care of us if we have his vision. So let's sing, everybody. God will take care of you standing together wherever you are. Let's sing.
may be seated. Amen. Well, welcome to church, all of you who are in our children's ministry. We're grateful that you can still be with us and you can worship with us even though we're not together up here on stage at this time. So I look forward to that time when we can be back together. But until then, we're going to keep doing our art. And so what we've been doing in these times is I'll give you a picture for you to draw that's kind of from the text or from the sermon. And today we're going to do just that. So I'm going to give you an art assignment. But this one's a little bit different. In fact, I think it'll be kind of fun as you work it out. This, this week, Jesus is being challenged about some Sabbath rules. And so there's a specific day of the week called the Sabbath. And as scripture says, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And so there were lots of people in Jesus today that would go back and forth about what that means and what it means to not work on the Sabbath. So they came up with all kinds of rules that meant that they weren't working. So they would say something like, you're not allowed to eat your fingernails on the Sabbath because they said biting your nails is work. And so they wouldn't do those kinds of things. And they would also say like you couldn't carry something on the Sabbath. So carrying any, even carrying like your keys or carrying your wallet that would be sinful on the Sabbath. So you don't do those kinds of things because carrying is sinful on the Sabbath, or so they taught. And so I want you to listen in the sermon. I'm going to have, in one part of the sermon, I'm going to list several things that they say you're not allowed to do on the Sabbath. And so listen for some of those extra ones. But what I want you to draw and think through with me on this is, so they would say, like, you're not allowed, let me put my wallet out here. They would say, you're not allowed to carry your wallet on the Sabbath because it's, uh, that's work then. And so other people, they would try to do something silly to get around the rules. Well, they would say, well, if I carry it like on top of my hand, well, that's not working. Or they would say, like, if I put it in my shoe, then I can carry it that way. That's not working. Or they would say, like, well, I could put it on my head. And if I'm carried on my head, then that's not working. And so they would try to come up with all these ways to kind of get around all the rules. And so what I would say this morning, as you draw, maybe draw somebody trying to get around those rules, like carrying something on their head or carrying something on top of their hand, or carrying something with their feet, and how they got around it. So maybe, or maybe you draw a person carrying something in all of those ways, or carrying something in a unique way. And all of that kind of comes down on Jesus, and Jesus has an answer for all of it. And so what I want you to do is, as you're drawing these things, listen in the sermon to how Jesus answers those, and how Jesus speaks to all of that silliness, and what Jesus calls us to instead. Okay, so listen carefully and draw those things out during the sermon. So let's pray together. Father, we're grateful that we can come together and learn about your word. And Lord, we're, we're grateful for the children of this church. And Lord, we pray that you would help them better understand who you are. And Lord, we pray that you would build them all up into mighty men and women of God. And Lord, we can't wait to see what you're going to do in their lives and how you're going to develop them and make them holy. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So let's continue to worship and just ask the Lord to give us the, the vision. Give us how does he see the world. Let us see through Jesus' eyes. Be thou my vision, standing together as we sing.
Amen. If you would, turn with me to your listening sheet. It has our reverse scripture for this week that we're going to read aloud together. It's Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. So if you would, stand with me and we'll read this aloud. This then is the text for today. And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need, and he and his companions became hungry? how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so the Son of Man is Lord 
even of the Sabbath. May God bless the reading of his word. You know, when you get to a passage like this week's reverse text, it's very easy to get sidetracked. There are lots of different places that we can go today. In fact, there's lots of great and wonderful things that we can learn and long trails that we could go down. We could get into the life of David and how Saul chased after him. We, we could parse what it means to have daily bread from heaven. We could run down the rabbit hole of Sabbath regulations, and all of those detours would be delightful, and they would be justified. You know, it's like you're driving through the countryside, and one road looks enticing, and, and so does another and another. But as we work our way through this passage, we need to get to where we are going. We don't want to tarry too long on the side streets. In fact, we need to get to Jesus Christ as fast as possible. Amen. But on the way to Jesus, let's talk about the bread first. Bread plays a prominent role in Scripture. Bread sat in the temple. We pray for bread in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus used bread as a continual metaphor about who he was. But today we see Jesus in, in the grain. We hear Jesus referencing the bread. But, but today he's not using it as an analogy. Jesus is talking about the very bread that we eat. And it's his disciples that day who are hungry. And they, they pick the grain as they're walking along on the Sabbath. They were hungry and they ate. And see, when, when they are, they're challenged here, for doing this, Jesus points them all back to 1 Samuel 21. And in that story in 1 Samuel 21, uh, David is running away from Saul because the, the kingdom is, is falling apart and falling into the hands of David, and Saul is chasing him out of town, and, and David is, is running to get away from that fight that was coming. And, and David runs into God's house. And he runs for protection in God's house. And, and as he comes into God's house, he's hungry and he asks for bread. Now, this seems innocent enough for somebody to run into God's house and ask for bread. Because they had bread. And what we know from this first Samuel passage is that the priests would bake 12 loaves of bread every week. They were large. They weighed about six pounds each. And so every week on the Sabbath, they would bring 12 loaves of bread and they would set it before God in the sanctuary. It was, it was the, the presence of God that was coming and, and felt in this bread that was baked. And, and as it goes in the Levitical law that we see in Leviticus, that each week when that bread was replaced, the priests were allowed to eat the bread. And that day, as David ran into the house of the Lord looking for something to eat, the priests had compassion and mercy on him and laid it before him and let David eat. You see, as David was, was running from Saul, he, he, he saw this terror behind him. And as he saw the terror behind him, he ran into the house of the Lord, and God provided for him. God, God gave him the daily bread that he needed that day. And this is just the kind of thing that God does. If you are God's child, you are forever taken care of. Even on the run, God is with you and holding it together and providing for you. And it doesn't matter where you're running from, and it doesn't matter who you're running from, if you're running into the arms of the Lord as a child of God, you will be taken care of. And God will provide every single thing that you need. See, God knows what you need right now. God knows what, what your life is about and where you're headed. And God is going to provide every single thing that you need. In fact, God's already set a course in motion so that everything that comes up along the way, God has already taken care of it. He's already provided for it. And so we don't, we don't worry about tomorrow because God has taken care of it. Yeah, there, there's, there's so many among us, though, who get caught up in the future and, and worried about what's next, and we're worried about what's becoming of the stock market, and we're worried about what's becoming of the country. But God has already seen it, and God's already seen it all, and God has already provided for it all. You see, those kinds of things don't set the course for your life. It is God alone who sets the course for your life. And God is going to set the course, and he's going to mark the way forward, and he's going to provide everything that you need every step of the way. 
your daily bread. And as we pray, it is provided each and every day. So this passage, it is about bread, but it's about much more than bread. You know, one of the constants that we see in Scripture is Jesus Christ referring back to the text. Jesus Christ taking people back to the Word of God, taking people back to the Scriptures, that Jesus Christ knows the Scriptures inside and out. And listen to how he challenges the Pharisees. Let's look at verse 25 of our reverse text, Mark 2, 25. And Jesus says to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? What Jesus does, whenever Jesus is challenged, he goes back to the Word of God. He's mining the Scriptures for truth and reality. And that's one of the things that we have to recognize. There's all kinds of voices around us, and there's all kinds of people speaking into our lives, and there's all kinds of agencies and organizations and groups that are speaking into our lives. But when we want to know truth, and when we want to find reality, it always comes back to the text. It always comes back to the Word of God. And when Jesus Christ is bringing out truth. He's setting it in the Word of God. And whenever Jesus Christ is challenged, he's bringing people back to the Word of God, Scripture itself. You know, it's the same, same thing Jesus does when he's tempted in the wilderness by Satan. Jesus throws Scripture at Satan and neutralizes the attack. You know, this is an excellent way for us to live out James 4, 7. Look with me, if you'll turn with me there to the book of James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And into verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. When we're faced with trial and temptation, the best weapon that we have is the sword of truth in the scripture. And Jesus is our example here. You need to, to know this book inside and out, cover to cover. And, and when you know this book, page in and page out, you have the power of God ready in your mind. You have the power and authority of God ready in your hands to meet the Pharisees, to meet any of Satan's minions, to meet any challenge this world throws at you. The, the answers are here. The way of life is in front of you, and it has been set forth in the Word of God. You know, there's a lot of people around us, even a lot of believers, who believe that if they could just come up with the right ritual, then everything will be okay. Or if they can just come up with the right formula of prayer, the, the right words to pray, then, then the, the, everything that needs to happen will happen. That they could stand in the face of trials and temptations. But the reality is, you, you need more than that. We, we need a deep and lasting, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, and you can't come into that deep and relationship with God without knowing his word, without hiding his words in your heart. And let's, let's pause here for a minute because this is the best thing that we can do for our children is to help them hide these words in our heart. You know, it's kind of like we were saying before, parents and grandparents alike worry over the outside forces, the, the ways of the world, the ways of culture, and how they press in on our children. And you know, one of our responses to that, when, when it seems like the world is just pressing in too much on us, is to just sort of hunker down and shelter in place and try to just keep everything at bay. And, and there, there's a time and there's a place for that. But the most important thing that we can do, because all of those trials are going to come and the world is always going to be pressing in. And the way that we fight back and the way that we push back is hiding the word of God in our heart. And the way that we set our children up for success, the way we set our grandchildren up to, to, to make it through this world is to help them know and hide the word of God in their heart. And if they know and hide the word of God in their heart, they are prepared and they are able to handle anything that this world throws at them. What we need to recognize is in the Spirit, the Word of God is all that we need. And the same thing for your children and your grandchildren and your family and the people around you. What they need is not to shelter in place. What they need is the Word of God imprinted on their hearts, tattooed onto their minds, so that any time troubles come or trials come, the Word of God is, is on their lips and spoken in truth. 
It is what we need, and it's what we hold dear. You see, when we fill, when we're filled up with the Word of God, we know power. But without the Word, we're powerless. With the Word, the victory is ours. And so, so don't give up on the Scripture. This is our truth for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And what we know is that long after we are gone, the Word of God will still be holding our children and our grandchildren up. The best way to prepare for the battles that are ahead is to know the Word of God inside and out. And so we see that in this reverse text for this week, it, it reveals the power of Scripture. But it's about more than Scripture. You know, if you ask those that were challenging Jesus that day what this text is about, they would say it's about the Sabbath. And more literally, they would say this is about Exodus 20, verse 11. And in Exodus 20, verse 11, it requires that you do no work on the Sabbath. And that's the tension here. The Pharisees argued that Jesus didn't take this seriously enough, that Jesus didn't live this commandment out fully. They argued that, that he didn't take what it needed to, to take Sabbath rest seriously. And for them, it was so serious that they worked really hard at not working on the Sabbath. In fact, there, there's, there's very little direction on how to define no work in the Scriptures. Now, there's a couple of things here and there. You see a couple of times in Scripture where it talks about what to do and what not to do on the Sabbath. But these Pharisees love to take the definition of no work and find tight and exhaustive ways to, to define this. In fact, they, they loved it. They loved to argue about what this could be and what this could look like. And so they came up with all kinds of rules to set the stage for no work on the Sabbath. You know, such as, you've probably heard this before, that on the Sabbath you can only travel about 0.6 miles in one direction. And, and interestingly enough, that, that actually doesn't start from just where you set foot out, but that rule says it starts 112 feet outside your community. So what you do is you, you've got your community wherever you live, and you have to mark out 112 feet out. And then once you get 112 feet out, now you can go about 0.6 of a mile, and then you can come back, and then you're not working on the Sabbath. But there were, there were lots more, like we were talking earlier. You, you, um, if you lifted a lamp, that was working on a Sabbath. In fact, if you poured a glass of milk, that was working on the Sabbath. You can't bite your fingernails because, yes, biting your fingernails is working on the Sabbath. In fact, you can't even stretch out your hand to receive something from someone else because if you stretch out your hand to receive something from someone else, that is working on the Sabbath. What the Pharisees loved to do, they couldn't wait to find something else that you couldn't do on the Sabbath. They loved finding something else that you couldn't do. In fact, they would define just about anything possible as work. You see, the Pharisees loved to, to burden people with these kinds of restrictions. And that, that, that sentiment was multiplied on the Sabbath. And so when they see Jesus' disciples come and pick a head of grain, they're going to let Jesus have it. How could Jesus be the Son of God if he doesn't take the Sabbath seriously? Now, the reality is, and, and we know this looking back on it, G Jesus honored the Sabbath. Jesus observed the Sabbath every week. He did take it seriously. Jesus honored the Sabbath exactly as God had called. They were just mad that Jesus didn't bring all the restrictions they wanted. They had lots of other things they wanted Jesus to impress on his disciples, and Jesus wouldn't do it. He wasn't going to impress on his disciples what they wanted. Jesus saying, we're, we're going to live out what God has called us to, and we're going to live it faithfully just as God called us to. And you know, we do this as well. We, we, there are lots of things that we want Jesus to judge. There's lots of people we want Jesus to judge. There's lots of things we want Jesus to answer. There, there's lots of things that we want Jesus to take seriously that it feels like Jesus is not taking as seriously as we take it. You know, we have our pet projects and, and our, our things that we're about, and, and we take those and we place them on Jesus, and we expect Jesus to just jump at our demands. Je Jesus, why don't you take this more seriously? Jesus, why don't you answer this prayer? Why don't you answer this question? And the reality is Jesus never jumps at our demands. And this is what we need to understand this morning. If you find yourself taking something much further than Jesus took it, 
You, you don't need to complain about what he's doing and where he is. You need to come back to Jesus Christ because he is the center. He is the word. He is the life. He is the Messiah. And so we come back and we fall at his feet, whether we run too far this way or we run too far that way. He's not going to just be chased back to where we are. We need to come and fall at the feet of Jesus Christ. Now, I do want to pause here for a moment and, and consider these Pharisees because what they're doing, they... They are trying to take the fourth commandment seriously. They're trying to honor God in their obedience. But what ends up happening is they try to honor God in their obedience. They go way too far with it. They go way over here and go much further than God intended it to be. Because God intended the Sabbath to be a day of worship and a day of rest every week. You, you need worship and you need rest every week. And when we don't have rest and we don't have worship, we're, we're worse for it. And, and God w was setting this forth, even in creation, from the beginning of Scripture, that, that creation needs rest and creation needs worship. And God prepared a day for that very thing because you need it in your life. And sometimes your flesh pushes back. Sometimes your flesh just says, I don't need worship this week. I don't need rest this week. But God says, you absolutely do. The Creator said, this is the way it works. You need worship. You need rest. You need me intimately. You see, the, the difficulty is, as we study this, and we study this in the Old Testament, and then we see what the, the New Testament has to say about Sabbath, we usually go the other direction. The, the Pharisees run way too far with it, take it way too seriously, go over the top with it. Then we, we usually go the other way. We're, we, we don't ever even consider it. You know, they're trying to get it, they're trying hard to get it right. And, and usually uh, we see believers that just don't want to wrestle with it at all that don't want to think about what it means to not work on the Sabbath. We don't care what it means and we're missing out. Let me invite you this morning to come back to Jesus Christ and decipher what no work means. His burden is easy and his yoke is light. And you know, that gets us to the heart of this passage. That, that gets us to the main idea. That gets us to where we need to be this morning. That gets us into the presence and the hope of Jesus Christ. Because this, this whole passage of bread and Scripture and Sabbath is ultimately about Jesus Christ. In fact, if you look with me, look at the last verse of, of our reverse text this week. Mark 2, verse 28. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now Jesus is making a mighty claim here. He's saying that, that he is divine, that he is the word of God, that he is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament, that he is the fulfillment of Scripture, that there is a new covenant in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. He's saying here, you, there's no restrictions that you can put on the Christ. He is God incarnate. And if ever we are struggling, we run to the Lord. Just like David ran into the house of the Lord. If ever we are struggling, if ever we are feeling overwhelmed, we run into the house of God and Jesus Christ will be there to meet us and pull us out and make things right. Jesus is the one who has all of the answers, the word of God himself. Every question that you have about this life is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not in ritual. It, it's, it's not just in saying the right things. It's about a deep and abiding relationship with our Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus himself. And you know what we recognize, just like David running in to see God that day and to be fed by the bread, Jesus has promised that he's going to provide exactly what you need when you surrender unto him. You know, that's the question before us this morning. Are, are you ready to submit to Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life? And that's where this, this last verse is headed. Will you answer yes to Jesus this morning? Will you say to Jesus Christ, your servant is listening. I am with you, I am here, and I will follow you wherever you lead. What, what you see in this text, Jesus is saying, the Sabbath has already surrendered to Jesus Christ. Now, the Pharisees didn't know it. They, they didn't know that the Sabbath had surrendered. But Jesus Christ was already in control. And, and you may not know it yet this morning, but Jesus Christ is already in control of all of it that, that seems like it's so wild and so foreign. Jesus is in control of all of it and everything that we face. And so what we have to recognize this morning is there is a choice before us. 
Are you going to fight Jesus and challenge Jesus and push back on what he's teaching, or are you going to surrender to him this morning? Because we have this example of the Pharisees all through the text where every time Jesus comes before them and he shows them the truth, they just push back with another challenge. It just seems like week after week they just keep challenging Jesus and pushing back and they're going to keep him at arm's length as long as they possibly can. And so is that going to be where you are? Is that where you're going to live your life in that constant challenge of truth and constant challenge of Jesus Christ? Because let me tell you, it's going to fall apart and fall apart quickly. The only place that we find life and hope and provision is when we surrender to Jesus Christ. And so what is it in your life that you haven't surrendered to him this morning? How haven't you surrendered to the Christ? Will we give it up for him? Will you give it up for the sake of our Lord and our Savior? Let's pray together. Lord, we know that there have been many times in our lives where we have behaved just like these Pharisees. Even after coming to know you, where we have challenged you, where we have pushed back on your truth, where we have denied your word. And Lord, this morning we pray that you would forgive us. Lord, would you hear our confession? Recognize our repentant hearts and forgive us. Lord, forgive us of of every time that we have challenged you. Lord, forgive us for not bowing our knee and surrendering unto your throne. And Lord, as we confess before you, we pray that your spirit would come in a mighty way. And Lord, that your spirit would show us a way forward that's pure and holy. That's the way of the Christ. Lord, and we, we admit, we, we don't know what all of this means. But Lord, we fall down before you. And we surrender our lives. And we give you control. Lord, we're, gonna, we're not going to fight for control anymore. But we're going to recognize you are the Lord. that we are yours. It's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. We're going to have our time of response now. And uh, we ask everybody in here to to faithfully respond to to Jesus in some way. Uh, There's some ways listed on the bottom of your listening sheet. Uh, Maybe you'd like to to pray where you are. Or maybe you'd like to to, um, concentrate on the music that we played and sung. Uh, The altar is open. If you want to come down and and pray and kneel at the altar before God, you can do that now. Um, I'll I'll be on this side. Brian will be over here. We're we're ready to receive you. If you want to talk and pray with us, we're here. Um, But every one of us, let's be obedient to the Lord this morning, faithful servants of his.
Let me give you a couple of life together moments. Uh, one, as we spoke of earlier this Wednesday, February 3rd, will be a day of fasting and prayer together. So please fast with us and uh, pray with us. Um, and we'll have the prayer service at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary that night. Um, also, be aware for Valentine's Day, we're doing something different uh, through our children's ministry this year. Um, this is an exciting new opportunity. We have daddy-daughter date night kits, and so that'll be available on February 14th. You can find more information about that um, on our website, so we'd love for you to, to do that and um, honor your children in that way. Uh, we also have another welcome to the world this week. God has blessed us with uh, many new births in our church family. So yeah, we're thankful for Pris and, and Carl and their new son, Roman. Um, what, a, what a wonderful new addition uh, to this world. God has been good to us. Um, and then also for me, you see these um, beautiful flowers in front of me. They're given to the glory of God in loving memory of Callie Smith. And I didn't know Callie, but I, I heard often from Don Guthrie how great of a man um, Callie was. And so we're grateful to, to remember him today by, by Rosemary, the Henderson family, and the Shapey family. So we're, we're grateful for that. Now, lastly for me, as we talked about last week, um, we are in our 160th year. And normally, last week, we would have celebrated our 160th birthday together and had a, had a wonderful time together as church. But in COVID, we're going to do something different. In fact, we're going to stretch that celebration from now all the way through October and have a big celebration then. Now, one of the things that you're going to see is about monthly, we're going to have some testimonies uh, from church members about this church and who we are and where we've been. And there's some remarkable testimonies coming, in, including right now. And so we've got a wonderful uh, story about this church and about this building, and I uh, can't wait for you to hear it. My name is uh, Pauline Conaway Foss. Uh, when I met Kurt, he, I saw he was a pillar of this church. And 
Uh, in his early life, he had not been churched, uh, but it was on the battlefield in Italy that he had an experience when he was injured. Uh, he prayed that God would save his life and that he would, he made the vow that he would honor him, him honor God with his life. He joined the church in 1948, and early on he was involved with many of the ministries here. Kurt was definitely a skilled metal worker. He learned the trade from his father, and his work can be seen all over this church. Uh, he made, and I'm sure installed the lights in the sanctuary, and also the beautiful uh, pulpit and also the original white metal uh, fence in the courtyard, um, the sign at uh, McCullough and uh, Broadway that announces uh, First Baptist Church and the handrails all over the place. <laughs> Kurt did want to serve um, his God with his work. When Kurt uh, learned that Unity Hall would be built, he wanted to uh, honor his God by uh, building and donating the chandeliers. Kurt and his son uh, handcrafted these beautiful chandeliers. They're 500 pounds each. Metalwork is hard. It's hot work but he wanted to give back to God um, what he had vowed, what his heart prompted him, and God honored him in so many ways for doing it. Sometimes I go to Unity Hall just to stop and think, and I look at the chandeliers, and I remember um, the beauty surrounded uh, surrounding uh, the marriage, Kurtz and my marriage under the chandeliers, and the friends that were being so happy along with us. So much has changed, but God is still good. <laughs>